on the smile. <laughs> but um, we we need to um, get started because, my goodness gracious, all we have that's involved and included, there's so much um, every week, as I was saying, I think it was to Christine, that it's like I've been drinking from a fire hose for weeks. <laughs> I, can't, I can't catch up. It's just overwhelming so much, so many chapters, but that's because of the nature of the books that we're now getting into chronologically happen to be Isaiah 66 chapters, Jeremiah 52 chapters, Ezekiel 48 chapters. So, you know, getting those big books, um, a little bit tricky, a little bit tricky. Let's see. Anything I should remember. I don't see the two childcare moms yet. But next time, I believe is the last of the other meetings that are going on on Tuesday morning uh, Bible study groups. And so we'll be by ourselves on Tuesday mornings. And um, the childcare requirements obviously are less. So they just need to know. So. Um, I think Nicole and Amanda are really our only two here usually. So, and they can't come every time because of little ones. So, doing better. Uh, bless her heart. She's has almost no range of motion in that right arm. That broken or yeah, broken elbow and her quite extensive surgery kind of surprised her to repair it. So she's in PT, and you know, it just hurts so bad. <laughs> Ride her bicycle. Yeah, oh yeah, as you go. Um, we're taking food to her. I, I talked to her last Thursday. She had just started PT, and I was checking on her to see how she was doing. And she was saying she had almost no range of motion at that time and was it took her an hour to eat her lunch or her breakfast in the morning. And I thought about that and thought about that. And then I went to fix myself my supper either that evening or the next morning. I think it was the next morning. It dawned on me how much I use my right arm without even thinking about it to fix just a little bit of something for myself. And that doesn't count going to the store, cleaning up, doing anything else besides just fixing something to eat. And I went and called us and delivered this girl something to eat. I'm very guilty, feeling very guilty. I feel so sorry for her. Oh, my. But she, there's a lot of folks helping out with that. So, um, and she has a son to help her. She says she can drive. I'm not. I'm not real sure that's real smart, but I mean, it's Priscilla. So she's gonna keep going, but she is better, but it's it's tough, it's tough, it's tough. So we'll keep her. Yeah, Loretta. Yeah, Loretta. So you can keep up with who's where. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And my goodness, are we are we ever creatures of habit? We're in South Dakota. Oh, yeah, I lived in South Dakota for two years. Way long ago. 71 to seven, almost 73. Brookings.
we moved, we moved there I, from Florida and the thing uh, in September. And I remember the thing that I most remember about South Dakota is I was never so cold in my life forever. <laughs> I mean, makes your bones hurt. And I remember um, the January after it was that many degrees below zero as I was old. Uh, this is insane. People should not live here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we moved to near Baltimore and there are more cars on the Beltway going around Baltimore, Maryland, than there are in the entire state of South Dakota. So, it's an amazing place. It's great place, great, beautiful place. And I first in all my life, the first I came to appreciate the pioneers. Because I went to some museums and and the things that and what our people that established this country went through. We need to appreciate. <laughs> And if you don't go to those kind of things, you can't. So that's enough of that. We're seven minutes into it and we're not starting yet. Goodness. <laughs> Let's praise the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your mercy, your has said, your loving grace to us that you have given us your word that not only instructs us, but teaches us from your heart and teaches us how you helped those people who went through judgment and trials and persecutions in the ancient days have instructed us for getting through the same experiences today. Thank you for this privilege of having it online and to reach people outside of our own church. I pray that you will bless us here in this church that we will not fail to share the gospel in our community and teach them of the hope that they can have in you. I pray that you would heal our country and protect our leaders. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Actually, we should op include Obadiah in this potpourri of prophets today, but that doesn't come actually in this reading till 34, week 34, which is week after next. So I I I thought about it if, if it's a dream that we would have time, but there are a number of prophets which were sent to Israel or Judah um, very close together, and we have some who are contemporary. Jeremiah, Habakkuk, or Habakkuk is how the, I think the, the Jews pronounce it, Joel, Obadiah, probably, and these are not absolute, and there may have been um, a couple of others who didn't write, but who were there to uh, preach. And the reason for the sort of the expansion of the number seems to be because we are now following the death of Josiah which we talked about last week. <clears throat> Remember, he was the last good king. He was the, the king who started as a second grader, eight years old. <laughs> and he was killed in battle when he went uh, from Jerusalem up toward the valley of Megiddo, or uh, uh, Jehoshaphat also. And that was to uh, try to... Uh, join an alliance with Egypt. 
against the forces from Babylon headed by none other than Nebuchadnezzar. And so we're at that time, the Battle of Carchemish is the name of that battle. Josiah never made it. He was killed in Israel before he got there. So, and that was uh, God's plan for him. And so the Battle of Carchemish, which is historically recorded in many places in world history, was in 609 BC. And it was when the Babylonian empire began because they had defeated Assyria and all of its allies and were on their way to knock off Egypt eventually. And that would establish um, uh, Babylon as the new empire. So it was known to everybody in Judah in 609. It would take a little bit of time before we would see things unfold with these prophets, but we probably, one of the earliest may have been Habakkuk, who probably uh, said his, uh, wrote his prophecy, maybe 607, and uh, Daniel, I forgot to mention, was also contemporary with these. And in 605 is when Nebuchadnezzar, on his way uh, for the second time, he was on his way to uh, deal with Egypt. Um, he, he didn't get that far because his father died. And so he had to go back to Babylon to secure his throne make sure none of the relatives got there before he did. And he had to be there in person and have from his father to him passed down the throne in Babylon. So he was away, but on his way back, he stopped through Jerusalem and put under threat because Josiah was now gone. Uh, Josiah had a son who uh, came to the throne, and we'll get through this in history. I just want to go through. I'm not going to go through all their names or anything. He had a son. He, his son, after three months, was taken to Egypt by King Necho, Pharaoh Necho, Nico, I guess. Um, and he's out of the way. And um, Nico uh, uh, was going to rule um, Jerusalem from Egypt and be over, but Nebuchadnezzar went and put someone, Jehoiakim, K-I-M, <laughs> on the end, uh, on the throne, and he was a vassal king. He had to serve under um, Nebuchadnezzar, and he was there, I think, 11 years. He was an evil king, and he was there, but Daniel and uh, many of the royal children, young people, young, they, they weren't little kids, they were young people, who were considered to be the cream of the crop, were taken with Nebuchadnezzar back to Babylon to be taken in. And when we get to uh, Daniel, we'll talk more about that, to be taken in and absorbed and used in the palace in Babylon. So that's how Daniel got. That's at this time. Um, and uh, at this time, or very soon after that, um, Jehoiakim died and Jehoiachin. I, I remember Kim and Chin. <laughs> Chin is actually, or was actually a son of Josiah. Uh, a grand, uh, 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 a son of Josiah, but he was 18 years old when we're going to pick up here with Jeremiah. He was 18 years old when um, the second wave of the Babylonian activity came, and Nebuchadnezzar uh, came. His forces came in uh, 597. Uh, so we're just a little ways into the 500s now from 
from the Battle of Carchemish is not that many years. It's about 10 years or so. And so <clears throat> they put a brother of Josiah on the throne and renamed him, and he was Zedekiah. That's the last king of Judah, but he was put there by Babylon, and he was under their control, and so it was really the Israel, Jerusalem rather, was not a free um, nation anymore, hadn't been since Josiah was killed, really, and so we've Want to pick it up with Zedekiah? His uh, he had Metaniah was his Jewish name, and as the Babylonians would do, they would take the name away from the person and rename them with a Babylonian name, and that was a way to say "I own you." And so he was called Zedekiah. He was twenty-one years old when he ascended to the throne. By now, Daniel, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, probably Joel and Obadiah are already on the scene. Jeremiah and Josiah uh, were actually born in the same year. So we are now up to um, several years uh, for Jeremiah when he had, comes to this point. But, so I'm going to just kind of begin with Jeremiah, which is a little bit past the first two prophets that are in your little book. But let's just begin with historically Jeremiah to set the scene with what's going on and what these prophets are dealing with when they prophesy. So uh, Zedekiah is by 97 uh, BC, of course. He's, Zedekiah is the last king that's on the throne. The uh, Jerusalem has been under an evil king who was um, um, so bad to his people, unjust and so bad to his people, that Jerusalem and Judah was in pretty bad shape. And there was a great divide between the haves and the have-nots. And uh, there was huge pressure in the kingdom of Jer in Jerusalem, even though it was a kingdom, identifiable place geographically and so forth. They had to pay a lot of taxes to Babylon, and uh, there was there were times when. Um, the Jews said, no, we're not going to do this anymore. And that was one of the things that got Zedekiah in so much trouble. Because when he came on board, he said, I'm not going to do that. We're not going to pay him. We're going to keep the money for ourselves. We've been under this bondage for, I think it was 11 years or something already. And it was just really very oppressive for the people. Uh, he was not a good king. He was an idolatrous king, but he was nevertheless the king in Jerusalem. So um, uh, he was the one who followed just after the problems with saying we're not paying taxes anymore. And that's when uh, Nebuchadnezzar came back the second time and took Jehoiachin, who was 18 years old, had been on the throne less than three months or about three months, took he, his mother, and 10,000 other people back to um, Babylon as slaves but they were not treated like ordinary slaves, and it included Ezekiel. That group, the second group, included Ezekiel, and that was about 597, 96, right around that amount of time. Yes, yes, he was the son of Josiah. He was the son of Josiah. He would be the seed in exile. He was put in prison in Babylon, 
but he was kept in a special area of prison for royalty and he was treated as royalty. Later on, he would be released uh, from, uh, but not by Nebuchadnezzar, it would be um, one that followed him. But he was taken away. So right now we have uh, two times Jerusalem has been uh, overtaken, so to speak, by uh, Babylon. Uh, there have been two waves of exiles. The first was a very small one. The second was a little larger, but it took, and it describes, and we'll read it when we get to the history, reads the um, small business owners, the educated people, the craftsmen, you know, the people who could be valuable over there in Babylon. And it left really a very bad mess in um in Jerusalem. And so we pick up here of the great distress now that is in Jerusalem. It is full of idolatry, false prophets. People are turning away from God. God doesn't take care of us. He doesn't love us anymore. Even though we're his people, we don't, he doesn't love us anymore. He's gone away and they uh, uh, rejected him. They, uh, Ezekiel had the same problem. When we get to Ezekiel, we'll see he had the same problem because the people that were taken away were just as, had their teeth on edge just as much as those who were left behind. So, um, but Zedekiah uh, broke his oath and about 10 years, he was 11 years on the throne. And that's where we get Jeremiah. Um, he was started in 597 or so. Uh, Jeremiah speaking to the king Zedekiah. He did speak to um, Jehoiakim, but Jehoiakim completely refused. And uh, I'm sorry to kind of be running around here. I'm trying to take too much at one time here. But what I want to do is talk about a little bit about Jeremiah, who he is, and what God did to prepare him to come as a prophet during exile. And then I'm going to go, uh, I'm not going to do too much about his message or anything, but we just need to kind of lay the land for uh, these prophets are fairly contemporary. We don't know how much they talked to each other, if at all. There's not really any evidence, but they were contemporary. And so, and they had Habakkuk and Jeremiah disagreed in the way they started out very strongly. So it would almost be like political commentators on a TV who one takes this side, the other take, and they go at each other and they have their own point of view. And I'm right, no, I'm right kind of a thing. It could have been, uh, I don't know that it was adversarial. It was just... Um, a difference in how they understood what God was doing. It was total turmoil. Total turmoil. And so Jeremiah was born, actually, let me just back up now. He was born during the reign of Manasseh, like Josiah was. And they grew up, and Jeremiah probably was there the day and would, in, in his youth, would remember when they found the scrolls in the temple and read them and what was going on. And he also observed what the response was of the people because they did not respond to the revival that Josiah tried to bring. But we read in the beginning of the um, chapter for Jeremiah, he is the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests living in Anathoth. That's probably not how you pronounce it, but that's how <laughs> phonetically I'm pronouncing it. And why is that important? Well, historically, Anathoth was the place where the priest in the line of Eli, remember way back in Samuel's time, 
what did Eli, what was his claim to not fame? <laughs> he was not faithful, raised sons that were not, he was a priest, not faithful. And under his watch, the, the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines. And um, the, uh, his grandson, Ichabod, was born. And the Lord has left us. All of that history there. At that time, the prophecy through Samuel was, no one in your line will serve the temple or the tabernacle as priests anymore and you will not live to an old age. None of your family will live to an old age. So uh, there's a lot of other people in scripture that are from that, but Anathoth is only like three miles down the hill from Jerusalem on the northwest side. It's easy walking distance, and, and it was a fairly large town, and it was a city of refuge. So um, he was a priest that was there. He could work there, but he could not come to the temple to work as a priest. So he wouldn't be in the uh, rotations. Uh, uh, Solomon banished, um, um, oh, I've forgotten his name. The Solomon banished one of the priests there, uh, Abiathar. He was... You can't be my priest anymore because you have are in this line of Eli. So it, it was important to know. And so nobody was going to like what he said simply because of who he was. So he was born with strikes against him just because of his heritage and where he was from. That's an important thing to remember. And he, it says here, began his prophecy in the, uh, the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. So we know exactly, and that would put you at 627 B.C., and as far as we can tell, until that 586-87 time of Zedekiah, he did his prophetic work from Anathoth. And then we will we, we'll read, and you will read in the first chapters of Jeremiah, that uh, his own family tried to assassinate him when he started with these prophecies, and he had to leave Anathoth and go to Jerusalem, where he was constantly, they tried constantly to assassinate him. So he had a very tough life as a prophet, and we'll see why. His message, nobody liked. Zephaniah was also um, in that, um, we read last week, Zephaniah is one of his contemporaries. This was such a bad time of judgment that was coming on Israel. And God said, I'm never going to do anything without warning you, sending you warning and telling you what I'm going to do. And so we see when there's a lot of prophecy coming to Jerusalem, duck and cover. <laughs> it's going to get bad. So I'm not going to uh, talk too much about um, Jeremiah except to kind of put him historically in place. And we'll spend more time on his message, hopefully next time, because that's kind of that whole week is in Jeremiah. But before we leave him, we have these very clear words that are in the first chapter, fifth verse, I, God speaking, chose you before I formed you in the womb. Before. You were not even yet conceived yet. He knew he was going to have a short life. That's because of the prophecy that your line won't live to old age. And I need 40 years of work out of you. So we're going to start early. <laughs> before you're conceived. And so he was set apart. 
and look at what his appointment is in verse 5 of chapter 1 of Jeremiah. Because all of these prophets said, I'm a prophet to Judah or Israel or the people or whatever. Who was he sent to? The nations. So it's, it's not like any other time before and certainly not after there was not going to be a kingdom in Jerusalem. It's going to have to talk to the nations. It's going to include a lot more than just the little kingdom of, of, in Jerusalem. When this word came to um, Jeremiah, he must have been probably 19, maybe 20, because uh, Josiah was 21 in his 13th year and they were born about the same year so he was probably 20 years old and at this time he knows enough about where he lives and who his people are he said wait a minute i'm too young for this i'm a youth a young man and, and I can't speak because I'm young. Nobody will pay any attention. Jeremiah actually says he protested. I think that's interesting. If you feel comfortable enough to protest the Lord, what does that say about your relationship with him? It's good. If you feel that it's okay for you to protest against God, you you fear him, but you feel like you can talk to him. And that's an important thing for us with Habakkuk as well. I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. And what did the Lord say? Don't be telling me that stuff. I'm not paying any attention to your complaints. Same thing pretty much he's told to Moses. <laughs> Look at verse 9. Then the Lord reached out his hand, touched my mouth. Did we hear about that before with the prophet? Who was that? Isaiah had coals and the tongs and the seraphim touched his mouth. And what did he say? I have, meaning it's already done. Now filled your mouth with what? My words. See, I have appointed you today over nations and kingdoms to do six things. List there. And this is your commission. This is your calling. And this is your life's work. Write this down, Jeremiah. This is what you are to do. You are to uproot and tear down. You are to destroy and demolish. And you are to build and plant. Now, don't you know he's saying, and I'm from Anathoth, and I'm a priest from Anathoth. This is not going to work out well at all. This is not possible he goes through and, and I'm going through this um, just to so that when you read this prophecy you have the perspective these are real people that actually lived in history and actually experienced these things and then wrote about them and they experienced how they experienced God and we need to learn from from that message there and he says, um, down, jump down to chapter one, we'll, and we'll stop here with Jeremiah. Chapter uh, one, verse 17. Now get ready. Hitch up your britches, roll up your sleeves, get yourself ready. Stand up and tell them everything I command you. 
Do not be intimidated by them or I will cause you to tower before them. Today, I am the one who has made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land. I've toughened you up, Jeremiah. I've made you a fortified city, iron pillar, and bronze wall. All this tough stuff. All, he's protected him and equipped him physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually to do this. And what against the kings of Judah, that would be uh, because he started uh, with um, the ones that were there for a few months as well, all the way through Zedekiah, who would be the last one against this kings its officials, its priests, the population. They will fight against you, but never prevail over you, since I am with you to rescue you. Now, when you get to the place where they put him in the cistern and even Melech has to come and run, he's going to be sitting in the mud that if he actually... He's not sitting, he's standing in the mud at the bottom of the cistern, which would have been five feet or more deep. And if he sat down, he would have drowned in the mud. And so he's stuck in this cistern and Ebik Melig is sent to rescue him. He must have been thinking, did I remember this right? Did you going to rescue me? Read Jeremiah with this message in your mind. It is horrible in Jerusalem. Horrible for most people, even wealthy people. It is horrible. Uh, so let's jump to back to the beginning of the week, Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a, a very short book. And it is unclear if he actually spoke to other people this message uh, because it is a very unique prophecy, but it teaches us some things that none other of the prophecies teach us. So I'm glad that it is included. Now, this would be under Jehoiakim, North Korean leader Kim. <laughs> you know, Kim, try to figure out, not Zedekiah, this is before Zedekiah, this is Jehoiakim, and he reigned 609 to 598. Now, there were a little bit of, uh, a few months between Josiah's death in 609 and um, him coming on board as the king. There was another one. That's when Nico took him away to Egypt and so forth. So Jehoiakim is um, on the throne. He is primarily under the control of Nico of Egypt, but also of Babylon. Uh, and... Um, It is uh, probably contemporary with the time, about the time Daniel was taken away in 605. It was probably contemporary with Zephaniah and Nahum, which we read last week. So there were a lot of activity going on, prophetic activity going on, but it was now clear as we'll see in uh, Habakkuk, that the Babylonians weren't going to start stop at Carchemish and leave it at that. They were going to take over and include all the way down to Egypt and Sudan, what would be an Ethiopia today, <clears throat> all the way around and all the way back, and a huge empire would be uh, developed under Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah was probably an Anathoth, and Habakkuk is a uh, part of the royalty, although not in the line as king. He would be of the royalty or the educated, um, well-off people in, uh, in Jerusalem. 
he would be living in Jerusalem and be privy to everything going on in the palace as well as uh, and the temple and so forth. And we know all, we don't know his parents. We don't know um, if he had a wife or children or really his age or anything of those things. That is not, the Lord didn't feel like he needed to discuss any of that with us. So we'll just begin where the Lord begins in his um, recording of this man's experience. The whole book is really a dialogue between Habakkuk and the Lord. It seems to be in private. In other words, just the two of them. And this again explains a relationship between a man and the Lord, meaning he felt like he could talk plainly and bluntly, even accusatory, to the Lord. You, you want your children to be able to come to you and scream at you and say, no, I'm not going to do it, or I hate you, and all of that stuff, knowing that you're not going to kick them out of the house. You know what I mean? It really is a, speaks volumes about this man's relationship with the Lord. So we can learn an awful lot about it because he had to have his whole life and heart turned around from where he started to where he ended. And that's the lesson for us that we get from this uh, book of Habakkuk. Because relationships with the Lord have to grow in the way the Lord wants us to uh, be developed. So when you um, look at this, it's important to remember that God has feelings and he expresses those feelings. He's not some abstract concept living out there in heaven and uh, lording over with instructions and directions and judgments and so forth. He has feelings and he expresses those feelings. And I was trying to, and let me see where I read it, but or where I wrote it. Uh, you have too many notes. This is... This is what happens to you. Okay, here it is. Uh, we have uh, what is uh, referred to as prophetic perfect tense, meaning when the prophet speaks or, or when the Lord speaks, it's as if it's already done, but he's writing about something that's going to happen in the future. But also, the idea is that when you see it written out, especially in some of the Bible translations, you see some that is written like it's poetry and some that's written like it's just prose, you know, just regular sentences and paragraphs. That's helpful because apparently when the Lord speaks his heart, he writes in poetry or he speaks in poetry. Now, remember, it doesn't rhyme in Hebrew. It's just rhythmic and poetic and pictures and um, that sort of thing. It is expressions from the heart. When we see it in the paragraphs and sentences and so forth, the regular in prose, he's writing from his mind. And this is God's word expressed through people. So when we read this, we need to see the feelings between God and um, uh, the person. So something got under Habakkuk's skin here. 
and he goes someplace probably away from everybody and maybe under a tree or something by himself. It apparently is in private, and he puts in to talk to the Lord and complain profusely. And it essentially is, how long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen? <clears throat> Praying and I'm not getting an answer. And it's essentially saying, don't you see what's going on down here? <laughs> don't you see how, how unjust and horrible and immoral and idolatrous this place is? These are supposed to be your people. Why don't you come down here and do something about this? And that's what I have said that so many times recently. America's not Israel, and I'm not confusing them at all, but I keep saying, why aren't you doing something about this? I learned an awful lot and been humbled greatly by this book as a result. God let him say it. And he uses a word that we need and haven't used yet, but we need to pay attention to. Violence. When you have lawlessness and disorder, it creates such fear and such chaos. Look at America. When you are off afraid for yourself and your children in your own house and community and neighborhood, that, that's the kind of violence that was going on in Jerusalem. It was horrible. And Habakkuk, or Habakkuk is saying, why don't you do something about this? I know you see it. I have prayed and asked you to come, and what's up? It's not happening. He also uses the term injustice and wrongdoing, oppression, violence. Look at those terms. That tells you what was going on contemporary with this man's life when he's writing this. This is what's happening in his life, in his world. And the Lord answers. And we don't know if he heard it or it was just in his heart and mind, or, or somehow um, Habakkuk understood that God answered him, verse 5. Look, that really should be behold, the old King James behold, because it is not just look with your eyes, but look with eyes that see, <laughs> that can appreciate really what's going on more than just sort of casual observation. This is he says, now look at the nations and observe. That's all the countries around that are going on right now. Remember Egypt, Babylon is rising, uh, Carchemish has fallen, Assyria has fallen, um, uh, Israel is in bad shape. All this stuff is going on. These are actual contemporary events. And he says, uh, the Lord says to Habakkuk, be utterly astounded, for I am doing something in your days, meaning in your lifetime, that you will not believe when you hear about it. You're not going to believe. And how many times just what in the world? I do not believe that happened. I have no idea what you're doing. And then he says in verse 6, I'm raising up, and it says Chaldeans. That's another name for Babylonians. That's the ancient genetic heritage of the Babylonians. They were first known as Chaldeans, and uh, Babylonians is the same thing. There are people who refer to the people of Babylon as Chaldeans even today, so uh, it is a long-standing thing. I am raising up these Babylonians that bitter, listen how he describes the Babylonians, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces 
to seize territories not its own. Well, that's what they are already underway doing, and um, Habakkuk had known seen that. They are fierce and terrifying. Their views of justice and sovereignty stem from themselves. They have their own ways of doing law and order. The horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than the wolves at night. The horsemen charge ahead. Their horsemen come from distant lands. They fly like eagles swooping to divide. Talking about this army that is totally invincible. They have overcome already that massive Assyrian empire and they're on their way to finish up building the empire. They sweep like the wind. They're guilty and their strength, I'm reading in 11, the end of 11, they are guilty. Their strength is in their God. That means they have their own gods and they look to their own gods for their strength. And pretty much what you would expect, Habakkuk says, you what? What are you doing? The Babylonians? You are using Babylonians? to take care of your judgment on us? What is, what is this? What? And I must, he must have thought, well, you told me I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it. Aren't you from eternity? Heaven, Lord, my God, my Holy One. You're not going to die. You're going to live forever. You have appointed them to execute judgment, my rock. This is a personal relationship with who he believes and knows about God. He knows God. You destined them to punish us? You're too good for this. You're way above them. You wouldn't use People who are worse than us here in Jerusalem, who are violent and oppressive and all of that, and lawless, you're going to use somebody even worse than us to judge us? That does not make any sense. Oh, wait, you told me I wouldn't believe it. You told me. Habakkuk now has a crisis of faith. Because he figured he knew who God was and how he worked and what his heart was. And he was saying, no, no, no. That does, you can't be a God who uses this terrible kingdom to destroy this, you know, come and then judge us. He has a crisis of faith, as with every one of us who comes to the point of, Am I going to trust God or not? That's that crisis point that in this situation, in my life, in whatever. It can be a short term or a long term or whatever. There's a crisis of faith. He now says, okay, and I kind of think he hedged his bet a little bit. All right. I'm going to stand, get up on the wall because that's how the uh, Babylonians would come. They would come to attack Jerusalem uh, around the wall. I'm going to set up on the wall in a guard post, station myself to look out. I'm going to wait and see what you're going to do. I'm going to wait and see if that's what you're really going to do. I'm just going to sit up here and watch and see if this is really going to happen because I'm not actually sure I believe it. <laughs> and uh, this doesn't make any sense to me, so I'm just going to sit up here and watch. And the Lord answered him and said, oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not going to sit up here and watch and wait. You are to get down there in Jerusalem and you're going to make posters that say and write it in such big letters and so clearly that even people who run by real fast can read it and know what it says. And you are to write this vision, the appointed time 
it's essentially what you would see in, in kind of movies and things and in, in plays and books and stuff. Um, the end of the world is coming on your sandwich board that's in big letters and you walk around um, in a neighborhood or something and said, uh, the end of the world is coming, prepare to meet God or something like that. And it's big letters and you don't have to stop and read. You can see it very quickly, even when you're just passing by. Habakkuk, don't be sitting up on the wall. I want you down telling people to get ready for the end, the judgment. He is now beginning to see, I'm not looking at this situation like I should be. I'm looking at it from my eyes. And I need to see this situation from God's eyes. And so he begins to change, and chapter two is his transition from his impetuous, almost childlike, rebellious prayer. It says, you know, stop this, stamp it with your big foot, and make it all go away kind of a thing to, okay, I'll do what you said. And he has to then... Let's go ahead, um, though it delays, wait for it. That means there's a time coming. It may seem like it's too long and delayed. It's not going to happen, but wait for it. This is the rest of verse 3, since it will certainly come and not be late. In other words, there's a time when this is going to happen. It did happen, and we'll read about that more in Jeremiah. And he's saying... Um, Babylon's pride is going to take over, and their greed is going to take over. That is uh, beginning of verse 4. They're going to do their thing because they are prideful and greedy, and they want to chew up all of the property and territory for their own. And they will do that, and I'm going to use it. But, circle that but, but, this is in the end of verse 4, but, and this is the famous verse, line, phrase, but look at it in context. This word faith, the righteous one will live by his faith, this is the second time and the last time in the Old Testament this word is written. The first time is in Deuteronomy, and the second time is here. And it is not faith in the way English translation in our head would be. It is faithfulness. Faithfulness. The righteous or the justified or the one made righteous. Now, remember about righteous? What makes us righteous goes back to Abraham. What is the statement? What did Abraham do to declare? Who? He, he believed God and he, it was declared him righteous. That was Abraham and that was the first understanding that is written clearly in scripture what righteousness is. It's not something you earn. It is declared by God, right? Let's clarify. Our, these words are so important, and uh, Paul picked them up in the New Testament, and so did the writer of Hebrews. <clears throat> they are three times in the New Testament. Uh, essentially the same phrase, and for the same reason. What he's saying is, uh, we're going to go through this phrase, but let's make it sure we got it in the context because it's so important. The judgment is coming. Tell everybody there is coming judgment. It's been appointed. It's on the calendar, God's calendar. It's there. Don't think because it's not here next week that it's not coming. Wait for it. It's coming. That's what you're to tell the people. And, and you can 
count on it because those Babylonians are prideful and greedy, and they're going to do it because they think they can. They know they can. I'm going to let them do it, but they're doing it because they think they're powerful and that they're going to take you over. They don't know that it's me that's letting them do it, advocate, but that's who's controlling all of this, and I'm going to use them. In the meantime, keep this in your thinking and in your preaching. The righteous will live through all of this by being faithful. Does that make sense? Take it in the context. Don't pick that little phrase out because it means something different if you take it out of context. And, and the Apostle Paul was careful to do that. But the three times that it's listed in the uh, New Testament, I'll give them to you, uh, will emphasize those three big words in that phrase, righteous or righteousness, and living, that is your life, living, walking, your relationship time with the Lord, and faith is um, described clearly separately. So there's an emphasis using this same phrase, but there's a different emphasis in the words. Romans 1.7 is the righteous one. Hebrews 10.38, we don't have time to go to these, is the one that looks at the life or living or walking. And Galatians 3.11 is the one that goes by faith and its faithfulness. That is enduring, overcoming, enduring to the end. It is not, uh, okay, I believe God and move on and live your life the same way you would always live it. It is uh, remaining faithful all your life. Hebrews 10.38, Galatians 3.11. Okay. There then follows a bunch of woes that uh, this is God speaking, finishing up his statement with Habakkuk. And these are God's curses on the nations, including Babylon, primarily Babylon, because what happens is Babylon is going to overdo. They're not going to just take Jerusalem. They're going to overdo it. And so there's going to, um, and it's going to be judged for its inhumanity, its greed, its pride. And it will forever in God's economy, be used as the example forevermore after this time as an example or a symbol of evil and rebellion against God. Just a quick interruption. Yes. It's, it's Romans 1, 17. Oh, did I write it down wrong? Thank you for correcting me. I've it's wrote that. 117, in case anybody wanted to find it. Okay, thank you. I said seven. It should be 17. I wrote down seven. I guess I had a upside down thing in my head or something. Thank you for correcting that because it's important for us to understand these words in the uh, New Testament as well because uh, we often quote this, the just shall live by faith and the righteous one will live by his faith. And that's an important piece there, his own faith. This is an individual thing. That's not a nation that we're speaking about anymore because God is dealing with these people differently. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go on then. There are curses, woe. There, are, You see those woes? There are five of them. They each uh, look at... Um, the things that um, were going to befall Babylon and the nations. And it's based on the principles in Deuteronomy of God's curses for everything. 
if the one who does this following thing, they will be cursed. And we read about that much most in Deuteronomy. Uh, idolatry and, and uh, injustice and all. It, those are the things that will cause the curses. I don't want to spend any more time on that, but let's go on to the very last verse in chapter two of Habakkuk. But we start out with a but. We're going to finish with a but in this chapter. This is kind of when uh, Habakkuk goes through this process of hearing what the Lord says, I'm using Babylon, but I'm going to punish them because they're going to over overdo and do things in their own power and uh, be way more unjust and cruel. I'm going to take care of them. They're going to be destroyed ultimately. And we go through and see what's happening inside of uh, Habakkuk's heart, because at the end of it, he comes to the conclusion. He's not sitting on the wall saying, I dare you, let me see you coming. To, uh, let me see those Babylonians coming, then I'll know you're telling me the truth. No, he's saying the Lord is in his holy temple. He's not speaking of the one on the earth. He's talking about the, his temple in heaven, the idea of his throne in heaven. The Lord is in his own throne in heaven. Let This is how Habakkuk is saying, I need to shut up and keep quiet. I need to stop right shaking my fist at God saying, do something about this. Like you owe us. He's saying, oh, I know who you are now. You are the God of everything and everything is in your control. And I need to be silent in his presence. Something happened between chapter two and chapter three. We don't know, but I think some time went by and Habakkuk probably was doing his uh, fall through. He's written out his posters. He's walking around Jerusalem and he's seeing something happening, I guess, because there's a totally different Habakkuk which shows up in chapter three than showed up in chapter one. So we read, it begins a prayer, another prayer of the prophet Habakkuk. Again, I think we're in, in the silence. I think it's in private. I think it's just between he and the Lord. But it is written as a shigonoth, shigionoth. I'm sure that's not the correct Hebrew way. But that is a type of Hebrew music, which is described as deep and stirring. It evokes feelings of um, awe and um majesty it's not like a hallelujah chorus it is more like a um bach kind of a song where you have this massive swells of organ music only there's words here bach doesn't do words too much but the idea is it's deep stirring uh emotionally uh, charging kind of music. And he begins his prayer with, Lord, I have heard the report about you. I've heard what people have said. I've heard what you're doing, what you're going to do. And all that walking around, he must have seen, oh, I see what you mean, what you're going to do. Lord, I stand in awe 
of your deeds. I stand in awe. This is the best kind of a song you can sing to the Lord is I am in awe. Um, I know that there are those who can do that and have sung those, and we have songs like that. I know what you did. And he says, and I know I, I remember what you did in the past. Recalling what he did in the Sea of uh, the Red Sea, um, taking him across the Jordan into the Promised Land, the falling of Jericho, all of their historical marvelous miracles that have happened. And he's saying, Lord, revive that same work that you did back then, that you brought glory to yourself. Revive it now, like in these years. Do it now. Make it known in these years, like in my years. Let it be in my lifetime. I want to see this. I want to see this. But not from on the wall just watching to see if I can actually believe that you're going to do what you're going to do. And I'm out of the way and not, I'm sort of observing like someone not involved. I want to see your glory. I want to see this happen in my lifetime. In sort of a byproduct of this prayer is, when you're doing this, in this wrath that you're going to bring, remember mercy. I read another place where the songs were, and we'll see this, God's has said, his loving kindness, his mercy, all of those things is stronger than his wrath. Stronger than his wrath. And that was his prayer. And then um, Habakkuk goes on through, and you will see it changes from uh, what you did in the past to uh, verse eight. It's in the it changes from the um, to the first person. Are you angry at the rivers, Lord? Is your wrath against the rivers? Is your rage against the sea when you ride on your horses, the victorious chariot? You took the sheath from your bow. The arrows are ready to be used with an oath. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains see you and shudder. He goes on, uh, drop down to 13. You come out to save your people to save your anointed. You crush the leader of the house of the wicked. <clears throat> that would be Zedekiah. It would have happened in his lifetime, but he's writing it as if it's already happened in the prophecy. You crush the leader of the house of the wicked and strip him from the foot to the neck. You pierce his head with his own spears. His warriors storm out to scatter us, gloating as if ready to secure, devour the weak. You tread the sea with your horses, stirring up the vast winter. I heard and I trembled within. That's how we respond. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bone. I trembled where I stood. That was, he had a, a massive reaction to this awesome experience. And this is all song, remember. This is all singing um, that he's doing. He's changed it into a song. And he's, and he's now changed again from speaking to the Lord, speaking about himself. I am responding to this, and I'm seeing, I am overwhelmed by what I see you're going to do and what you're, what you're working to do. And so now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. The Babylonians are coming, God said. When I told them to come, they will be there. Instead of saying, 
why don't you do something about this, meaning get rid of them, take care of us. Okay, you're going to judge us. I must now wait quietly in that day of distress. You see how convicting this is? To come against the people invading us. And he goes through, it's going to, though, the, though everything is gone, the fig tree will not bud, meaning there's no food. There's no fruit on the vines. There's no oil. The, there's no food in the crop, in the fields, no pr produce. The flocks will disappear. There are no herds. Everything's going to be gone. That's the wrath of God coming. All the food, all the future all the comfort, all the things that we've had are going to be gone. 18, yet. This is almost like Job. Though you destroy me, yet I will trust me. Though you slay me, I will trust you, yet. I will celebrate the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer. He enables me to walk on mountain heights. I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to be obedient and I'm going to be faithful and that's my salvation. I'm going to get through this because you're going to get me through this. Absolutely a marvelous, we've got to learn for today, um, prophecy. Wonderful prophecy uh, for us today. Let's quickly try to go through Joel, which is also in our reading, Joel, the book of Joel. There's a lot of controversy whether this is in this time period. It doesn't matter because it's applicable no matter when. And again, we do not have a single word about who he is, where he came from, what kings he served under, any of that stuff. So we have no real um, message about timing. But he also has extremely important things for us even today. Uh, most of the commentaries do think he is a pre-exile, meaning uh, this is before the Babylonians come, kind of a time period. The Babylonians are going to come during Jeremiah and Ezekiel. That's uh, during, and then they're going to be after the exile prophets, which we'll get to later on. And so this is Joel, and it's a tiny little book as well, but it's packed with stuff. And it is unique in that it teaches us about again and it's not the first time but it is recorded again the day of the lord now we read about that in amos we read about that in isaiah but it's it means the same thing so what is the day of the lord what does that mean that's a phrase that i wish we had more time to work on it but the day of the lord is a time when the Lord himself intervenes in the affairs going on in the earth. And, and it has to do with his plan, ultimate plan, <clears throat> which he began in the garden. And he will continue to intervene at various times and in various ways. He actually uh, does something usually very miraculous so that everybody knows it's from him, does something miraculous that influences or changes, so, for, so to speak, the course of history. <clears throat> so that it's sometimes referred to as a visitation of the Lord. Uh, it is the, the day of the Lord is um, a term which we need to understand as some a time when God is going to do something which everybody is going to be aware of. 
<laughs> and it is part of his plan to bring us ultimately to the to the return or the restoring of the garden. We started off with a perfect garden. It was corrupted. We've been living through the corruption, but God has promised to restore his creation and um, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And so he's moving in that direction. And a day in this uh, kind of a translation is not a 24 per hour period of time. It, it, the day of the Lord is a, an event kind of a thing, which may cover um, a period of time, or it may be very short. It, it, there's, it has to do with when you read about it and what is being discussed. And it is described in almost every time it is described as um, bad. It's going to be bad. It's going to be hard. It's going to be very destructive. Um, it's going to cause you to pay close attention. You're not going to be able to avert your eyes and it goes by and you don't have to interact. It's going to involve. And it is always preceded by a warning. And that's why he sends his prophets. Something's going to happen. Get ready for it. It does happen. And then we have to put it in perspective of how it fits into the overall plan that God has for us. So let's uh, <clears throat> look at Joel's prophecy. Joel is given a different perspective. Um, as the writer of Hebrews says, God did all sorts of ways to tell us who, what he was going to do and when he was going to do it. Uh, <clears throat> all sorts of ways until the Lord Jesus came. It's always a prophet who brings a word from the Lord. The Lord speaks his word in the Old Testament here to a person, a man in almost all cases. Anybody know who the first prophet ever was? No, nope, not the first. He was a prophet, but he's not the first. I had forgotten about this till I, um, before him, before Noah. Because prophets bring a word of warning from the Lord. So who gave the first warning? that there's coming a day when a flood's going to take everything out. So it's before the flood. Enoch. Oh, we don't have time to do too much. In Genesis, Enoch. Remember, he didn't even stay here. He got taken away. But he was the first to say um, a warning, give a warning. And he lived in an evil time too. So that sort of gives us a, a, a picture here of what he's saying. The word comes and we do know that he uh, gives his father's name, but that doesn't help us anymore either. So we'll go on. He is now going to describe an event that all of them lived through. And that's why I sent you that picture this time about the desert locust, because Joel lived through a time when the locust came to Judea or Judah and destroyed everything. We don't know exactly when that was because it happened more than once. And it, 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 there was not necessarily a reason to say it was this particular day or year or anything. And it was horrible. And it is a picture 
that God told him, Joel said, you know that thing that happened with those locusts and what the before and after, and that's why I wanted you to see the before and after and sort of the enormity of the destruction that these creatures do. And it usually the swarm lasts for about six weeks or so, and then it's over. And the real problem from everything being eaten, every every possible thing that they can eat is eaten, then there is famine and drought and starvation and lawlessness because if you have something to eat and I want it, I'm going to get it kind of a thing. So it is a real picture of um, terrible judgment. It's an event that happens, but it's the outcome that is so destructive. And when I read that, I thought, oh my goodness, a virus came here. And it lasted for a while and will last. But what was the outcome that we are now really dealing with in this country? Way worse than the virus. We have to have that picture because that's exactly the same kind of thing. And how do we know that that wasn't a judgment? We, we need to sit quietly and in awe. I stopped saying, God, why aren't you doing something? <laughs> because he is doing something. And I just need to, to believe it. And Joel starts out with, have you ever seen anything like this in your days? Has anything been this bad? I mean, it's literally we are now dealing with this terrible, destructive thing in real time. It's never been this bad, even back in our ancestors' day. Same kind of thing we say. It's never been this bad. Of course, they would have said, oh, yeah. It was, but, but prophecy is often sparked by an experience that the prophet will have. And that has happened several times. Jonah had an experience. <laughs> he, brought, he was a prophet that was different than when he started out and so forth. Okay. Verse four, what? The devouring locust has left, and this was the stages. I, I, I read about these stages, but they go through their um, um, hopper stage when they're first hatched from eggs. And I read that every single one of their eggs hatches, which is unusual. And there are billions of them when they hatch and they're hoppers and they eat everything. And then they swarm. And then the ones, the, the young ones uh, come after them and eat everything. There's nothing left. They're destroying insects and they have four stages that they go through, each more destructive. Literally when they're gone, there is nothing edible left. Now they don't attack the people, although I showed you the picture where they're swarming all over and it. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible. But he's saying in verse five, wake up, you drunkards, and weep, wail, all you wine drinkers. This is a picture of coming destruction here. The Lord told me that what you saw here and experienced here, it's going to be like that in the day of the Lord. And it goes through, look at the end of verse 12, after he's described all of the terrible things that are going to happen um, and did happen as an example with the locusts. Indeed, human joy has dried up. Not only are they hungry, starving, desperate, no future, nothing they can do. They've lost 
every bit of their hope and their joy in their in their lives. It's just over. When you lose your hope and your joy, there's not much left. So he says, dress in sackcloth. And he says, announce a sacred fast. This is verse 14 of chapter 1. Proclaim an assembly. Gather the elders and all the residents of the land at the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Why? He's saying, repent. Call on God. Because the locust in terms of uh, the Babylonians, the, the army of the Babylonians, it's going to come over and treat us like those locusts did. It's going to be the same sort of thing, only it's a military. Somebody's coming and will destroy Israel and Jerusalem. Whoa. Whoa. A curse. Because that day, for the day of the Lord is near. Something that the Lord has told me that's going to be like this locust um, event that we just is going to destroy uh, Jerusalem and Israel. It's going to come as devastation. Who from? The Almighty. God's going to do this. For chapter 2, blow the horn in Zion, that's Jerusalem. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near. And then we have the description, and this description is repeated almost every time in other other uh, prophecies as well all the way through till revelation of what that day is like it's a day of darkness and gloom a day of clouds and total darkness like the dawn spreading over the mountains a great and strong people appears in this particular time such as never existed in ages past and never will again in all the generations to come. An army like a, an army, a warrior of locust. It's literally heart stopping when you read the fifth trumpet blast in Revelation and it uses the locust plague as the symbol of in, in, in times. And out of that comes the 200 million army, 200 million man army from the pit in Revelation. That's Revelation, the fifth um, trumpet, which would be somewhere along 10, eight, nine, 10, that's around in there. The trumpets start um, early. They're just after the seals. And, and, and Joel goes through and continues to write the destruction and the horror and the, and the terror and the harm that these people are coming. Verse 10 of chapter 2, the earth quakes before them, the sky shakes, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars cease their shining. The Lord makes his voice heard in the presence of his army. His camp is very large. Those who carry out his commands are powerful. Indeed, the day of the Lord is terrible and dreadful who can endure it now this is an example of near and far prophecy it talked about of joel's day and it talked about a day that is coming even now this is the lord's declaration even with this 
promise of terrible destruction, here he further says, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. And he says, tear your hearts, not your clothes. In other words, this has to be a repentance from the inside not a repentance on the outside, which was the typical thing that the Jews did when they were in repentance. They would tear their clothes and, <clears throat> and mourn and fast. This has to be a tearing of your heart. And return to the Lord your God. This is the invitation. When this judgment is here or coming, this is what you need to remember. What does God tell us? In his wrath, he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and he relents from sending disaster. That's almost a quote from Exodus 34, 6, where he said the same thing to um, Israel through Moses. God is merciful, and his mercy is more powerful than his judgment. And he is slow to get to the point where he is going to destroy. And Joel says, if we do this, who knows, verse 14, who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. So you can offer grain and wine to the Lord. Remember, they couldn't even offer grain and wine because it had been destroyed by the locusts. They had nothing with which to worship either. It was terrible destruction. And he continues to say, you know, blow a horn, sacrifice, repent, humble yourself. And then we have something happening between chapter uh, 2, verse 17, and verse 18. Something happens. The last of 17, let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the portico and the altar, and let them say, have pity on your people, Lord, and do not make your inheritance a disgrace or object of scorn among the nations. Why should it be said among the people, where is their God? Then, if there's repentance, caring of your heart, humbling of your heart, then the Lord becomes jealous. Very strange terms here because there's an explanation. After the repentance or with the repentance, then the Lord becomes jealous for his land and spared his people. Now, in relationships, what does jealousy mean? Yeah, but if I'm jealous, I don't want anyone to touch what is mine. I'm killing you if you try to steal my wife. I'm going to kill you. And remember the relationship that is described all through the Old Testament. The relationship is described as the husband and the wife, God the Father, and Israel is the wife. Hosea did a beautiful prophecy about describing that relationship. And when God says jealous is no one touches the one that I love one that belongs to me no one this is feeling this is god having feelings and he's expressing it that way he's feeling and what does he do he's, his jealousy means that he spare his people and what did he do and we read about this in the um in, uh, in the first chapters of Acts there, when I think it's the second chapter, when Peter does his sermon, we read that it comes directly from um, uh, later on in this, in uh, chapter two. 
I'm about to send you grain, new wine, and fresh oil. He's going to restore, and we'll read it here in the end of, of chapter two, or, or further down in chapter two. He's going to restore all of the things that have been destroyed because of the judgment. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Let's jump down to uh, chapter 2, verse 25. And this is the Lord speaking through Joel. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust ate. It's not just a one-time six-week event. It's going to take years to get over it. And so, and we're running out of time here with this, this prophecy, but the prophecy is I'm going to restore my people after the judgment. Remain faithful, remain faithful. And they're never going to be, there's coming a time when I will restore you and you'll never again be put to shame. That hasn't happened yet, but it will. And then after this, after I restore the years, after that time, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Isn't that what Peter preached? Acts 2 at Pentecost and baptism. The Lord, uh, and there are many uh, references, cross-references that we haven't got time to go, but in, in many prophets where God's spirit will fill people. And how will it look? I'm going to pour out my spirit. I'm going to pour out my spirit in verse 29. I will display wonders. And then we read further in 21, a day is coming. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day. The Lord does what? That's the sixth seal. When stuff turns dark and falls and everything comes to an end. And then we have that wonderful verse, if you don't get anything else, and a lot of people uh, focus on I'll repay the years the locust ate, and that's good, uh, but that's not what we are going to need. We're going to need this in that great and terrible day the Lord comes, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, meaning <clears throat> on judgment day, that's when he comes again, that will be in judgment. And when he comes on judgment and we stand before, those who have called on his name are spared the judgment. First, uh, First John also goes through this. The name of the Lord will be saved, for there will be an escape for those on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised among the survivors the Lord calls. That is also in Zechariah, which we haven't gotten to yet, but that's in Zechariah in the 12th chapter, where at the Battle of Armageddon, which is when the Lord comes after that, a third of the people of God of Israel, only a third of them, but a third will be saved because they will look on him whom they pierced and wound. In those days, very good um, stuff that's going on. It actually talks about where that's going to happen in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's where the Battle of Armageddon is. That's why this is a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. Uh, <clears throat> chapter 3, let me just, uh, multitude, chapter three fourteen. Let me just make sure I'm where we are, chapter 3 of Joel, verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And a lot of people have read, had songs about this and preached about this. Joel, chapter 3, verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. 
And a lot of people think that's God, uh, that is our decision. We're in the valley. We need to make, this is God's decision. This is when he comes again and he chooses who his decision will be made at that time, who he's going to uh, save. That will be those who called on his name. And we have further then the, about the shaking and, um, and the darkness and the changes in the um, sky, the heavenly bodies. Finish up then with in the end of Joel, verse 17, 317, then. After all of that has happened, then you will know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem will be holy and foreigners will never overrun it again. This is the millennial kingdom that is being spoken about here. And where will this kingdom be? My holy mountain, Jerusalem. In that day, the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk. <clears throat> and, we, and we have the picture of the very end of uh, all of time here in the millennial kingdom and the new Jerusalem is a picture um, all streams of Judah will flow with water and springs will issue from the Lord's house, watering the valley of Acacias. Egypt will become desolate and Edom a desert land because of the violence done to the people of Judah in those days. And that was um, how you treat my people Israel is how you're going to be treated done unto the least of these my brethren will be done to you but judah will be inhabited forever and jerusalem from generation to generation i will pardon their blood guilt which i have not pardoned for the lord dwells in zion so this is a prophecy way down or we don't know how far down um, beyond where we are now so <clears throat> past time past time let me stop recording here